Writing and publishing a best-selling book, you hear a lot of these online gurus and experts spouting about this and that, that you gotta do their systems, you gotta do that system, and you gotta, you know what, let's just cut away all of the fluff and all the BS that's out there because I'm actually going to bring in someone who has walked the walk, talked the talk, and he's actually quite the resource. In fact, let me just share just a little bit with you here. His name is Nick Thacker. He's a USA Today best-selling author renowned for his gripping suspense and thriller novels as well as his nonfiction books dedicated to self-publishing. Highly recommend them, by the way. He has also made a significant impact in the literary world as the founder of Author.Email, an email marketing service tailored specifically for authors, facilitating effective reader engagement and book promotion. And most notably, Nick serves as the vice president of author success at draft to digital a platform aiding authors in self-publishing and distribution, as you might know. His multifaceted roles showcase his dedication to both crafting compelling narratives and empowering fellow authors on their publishing journeys. So I am just absolutely geeked up to share with you guys today. Nick Thacker. Nick, how you doing, buddy? I am doing quite well, man. That was uh, that was one hell of an intro. I really appreciate that. Yes, yes, uh, you owe me one now. Uh, totally, totally joking, man. Uh, if you guys and gals happen to be watching this on the live feed, you've got any kind of questions, please make sure that you post it inside the comments. Put a cue right before it so I know that's exactly what you, you know, wanting to get answered. And since we'll be discussing how to launch a best-selling book, please limit your questions to the topic. Thanks so much in advance. Nick, I'm going to blow it up now. We're going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about best-selling books. Let's just kind of lay the groundwork. To you, what is a best-selling book? I, I, I like the definition of a book that sells well because it allows enough, uh, I, I guess, articulation from whoever's doing the selling or from whoever, whoever the author is. Meaning, you know, what a best-seller looks like for me at this point in my career might look different to some other author. And I think that's that, that's meant to be encouraging, right? Um, I can have a best-selling book that, uh, in, you know, according to my definition, and you can have a best-selling book that didn't sell as many copies, but is still, in your definition, a best-selling book. I don't know if that's making any sense, but I don't think it has to be a label like it's got to be USA Today or Amazon hit number one in a category because these are games that you can, or these are systems that you can game, mm -hmm. right? And there's nothing wrong with those necessarily, but I just, I like selling books. And if a book sells well, um, I would call it a bestseller. Nice. Share with me a little bit. You actually had become a USA Today best-selling author. So what was that process like, and what does that compare to becoming a bestseller on a place like Amazon? Yes, yeah, so that's a big question. Um, I am a USA Today best-selling author, or I guess I should say I'm 120th a USA Today best-selling <laughs> author. Um, so quite a few years ago, there, I'm sure up until the USA Today list sort of stopped and I guess now restarted, yeah. um, there was this game you could play where you put in some money that's used for promotion and you submit a story uh, and it becomes part of a box set, you know, 20 books, it, it, all in one box set for 99 cents. And it has to be wide, so it has to be on multiple platforms. Um, and with within one week, you have to make a certain amount of sales. And if you do, you get to be a best-selling author according to USA Today. Um, that is probably still something you can do. I just, I, I haven't really looked into it recently because the, like I said, the list sort of stopped and, and they, they killed it and then they brought it back and I don't know what they're doing with it. On the other hand, there's the Amazon bestseller. This is the orange bestseller tag. You know, you can get the little, you know, orange tags, what we call them. Yeah. And, uh, and those are great. They imply that books have been sold, <laughs> um, but again, it's so um, it, it's so um, vague because it really depends on the category that you're in. Um, you know, if I am a if I get an orange tag in mystery and thriller, um, that's a lot of sales, right? Or or I should say it this way, it takes a lot of sales to get to number one in in that overall category. But if you're in some really really specific granular niche category where there's maybe two or three books a month that are released, um, it's not that hard to get that orange bestseller tag. So it, the, the, the quantity of sales don't, or you don't d determine if you're going to get an orange tag. It's really how big the category is you're selling in. Um, so that's why I go back to, yes, you can use that as your definition for bestselling author. Um, but, but I, I want to urge any newer author to not need to define it that way because you can have what you call a bestseller, um, Everyone's got their best-selling book. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. if, if I've released two books and one of them sold more than the other one, I would say the first one is my best-selling book. 
Um, I, I'm going to stop there because I know that it, it just depends on, on the definition. It just depends on what you're, uh, what you're targeting, what you're trying to do. What do you, what is your perceived value of that orange tag over on Amazon? What is your thoughts about bestseller on Amazon? Is it all that in a bag of chips or is it just a lot of fluff, smoke and mirrors? You know, it's, it's probably somewhere in between. Right, Dale. Okay. I mean, uh, it's it's definitely not just fluff. It it does mean you have sold some books. You can't get an orange bestseller tag if you've sold zero copies. Yeah. Um, and generally speaking, you know, we're writing genre fiction, commercial fiction. It's in a it's in a category that is pretty well um, well reviewed, pretty well researched, and a lot of readers in them. Uh, and so, if you get to a point where you've got an orange tag in one of those sub 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 categories, you've probably sold quite a few books, and that's a good thing. But again, um, it's sort of like putting the cart before the horse. If you're targeting just getting an orange tag, or if you're targeting just getting USA Today bestseller, um, you're, you're kind of missing the point. I, I really believe the, the goal is to try to find more readers and engage with them. And getting to a, getting a bestseller tag or USA Today bestselling uh, status might, again, imply that you've sold a lot of copies and you've engaged with some readers, but it doesn't have to. Um, I didn't engage with any of the readers when I got USA Today bestseller status, right? It was just a game that we played. Put the money in and get the USA Today tag out. I've had much better long-term, much more success long-term engaging with the readers that read the book and email me and, and respond to them and all that. And so I think ultimately that's my goal. I'm not going to try to target a list. I'm not going to try to go for the USA Today or New York Times or wh whatever it is. Um, the orange tag, those are great. But that's not my goal. My goal is to find readers and engage with them by literally giving them things that they want to read, but also talking to them, asking them questions, and just trying to get them to become fans of, of me, of what I'm writing, of, of the books that I create, right? That's, that's ultimately my goal. When you hit USA Today bestseller, I know there's going to be a lot of people asking, what was the amount that you had to sell in order to see that type of results versus say the two or three in some sub niche category over on Amazon. I can't remember the numbers. Uh, I wish I, I wish I had pulled that up. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if I ever knew the numbers of the sales. I, we put in, I think it was $500. So times 20, right? Everybody put in a certain amount of money and uh, we used all of that money for ads. And I, I did verify that the money was going to, you know, to, to, to ads and not someone's pocket. Um, yeah. so it was, it was clean. Like it was, it was a good, it was a good process, but again, it wasn't just my book on the list. It was a box set of 20 books and mine was just one of 20. Um, I don't want to make that, I don't want to say that to diminish the fact, I mean, we did sell a lot of copies. It was probably in the low 10 thousands range, I would guess. Wow. Like 99 cents. Um, but it's really tricky and I don't want to, I don't want to prescribe a number because every week is different. Yeah. And the way the lists are uh, curated, you know, d depends on the list and, and all that. But yeah, I think, I mean, I, I do know that if I were to sell 10,000 copies of any book um, in any of the subgenres that I'm in on Amazon, I'm pretty sure I would get that bestseller tag. That's, I mean, if I do that in the course of a week, that's a lot of sales. Yeah, that's a tremendous amount. All right, so let's back it up just a little bit because everybody's tuning in because they want to learn a little bit more about launching a best-selling book on Amazon KDP and beyond. So you're really good about laying out like the groundwork, the practical steps it's going to take in order to get something achieved. Um, what does publishing, writing and publishing a bestseller look like for you? And take me out, take me from the first step down to the last step. For me, um, again, my ultimate goal is not to hit a list. It's not to get an orange tag. That's okay. just gravy. That's icing on the cake, right? Yeah. But the cake is long-term career writing fiction. And for me, that doesn't usually look like flash in the pan, big promo, early launch, uh, fast launch kind of stuff. I've been, I, I this again, I'm going to tell you what I do, and this is descriptive, not prescriptive. I don't want anyone out there thinking this is what they have to do. Yeah. This is the only way to make it work because I, I do think I'm an anomaly. There's a lot of people who do the opposite of me and it works really well. And I tried that and it didn't work. So everything I'm about to say, like I said, descriptive, not prescriptive. Fair? Yeah. Um, so at this point in the game, uh, when I publish a book, if it's my, my own or through my publishing company uh, that publishes thrillers, we do what we call a slow launch. And it's exactly like it sounds. We're not trying to hit a list because, well, 
usually the Amazon machinations behind the scenes make things a little tricky or early on. You know, when when you first put a book out, some of you may have noticed that you know the rank doesn't show up for a few days, um, and we did some testing on that, and I'm pretty sure that um, that kind of um, cuts the knees out of your launch um, as far as the rank goes. The organic visibility goes down because those sales are sort of sort of lost. I mean, you get paid for them. Um, if if I sold 100 copies that first day, I'm going to get the money from that, but the rank doesn't move. And then when the rank does show up three days later, it's not reflective of having 100 sales the day before. Does that make sense? Um, so there's things like that that we're testing. Now, you may listen to this in 10 minutes from now, and that may be different. But the point is what, what we've noticed, what we've seen um, for my books is certainly true. I don't want to do that. I don't want to put all of my promotional might into those first three days. Um, but the other reason for it is I release iteratively, you know, kind of the lean startup methodology. Like I write a book and I want it to be as good as possible, but we all know the old joke, uh, the best way to find the typo is to publish the book, right? It doesn't matter how many rounds <laughs> of editing we've done or how many beta readers we have, and I have 200 of them. Uh, there's always going to be something that sneaks through. And so I'm not worried about that because I can fix it and I can get a new version uploaded in less than 24 hours. Um, so, but that's another reason not to throw everything I've got, money, energy, time at the book those first three days. Yeah. Um, so what it looks like for me is I've, I've got my book packaged up and it's all great, right? So cover, description, blurb, all that stuff. It's written, it's, it's edited, it's finished. 95% um, perfect. Knowing I can never get to be 100% perfect, there's no such thing. Yeah. Um, I'm shooting for 98, 99%, right? And that means that first couple weeks we're finding any last typos that, that snuck through. Uh, and we're fixing it up and everything. But that also means that the, the, those first two weeks is my slow launch. I've got two weeks now where I can start to let the let the rank show up and let, let it settle into the categories it's going to be in. We all know Amazon just changed how you do categories and they don't listen to what you choose. They just put your book in their own categories. So there's a lot of back and forth you have to do. Um, and so I, I will schedule my newsletter promotions or swaps, as we call or group swaps, whatever they are. Um, I'll schedule any ads I plan on running for the first two weeks, usually not the first week, but that second week after launch is when I start that stuff. Yeah. So if someone's going to you know, do a newsletter swap with me, I'm very loose about what date they do that. I don't need it to be on launch day. I don't want it to be on launch day. So I'll, I'll reach out to them and say, hey, I'm going to launch a book. Do you have any time in the next month to do this? If it happens three weeks after the book is launched, that's fine. That doesn't matter. Um, now, all of that to say, I'm not telling you that's what you should do, author. <laughs> uh, that's just what I've found, and I've you know published about 40 of these things now, and so this is working really well for the genre that I'm in, for the, t the style that I write. That seems to be what's working really well. Um, it's kind of an aside. This is some similar to like I started watching this show called Suits on Netflix. It kept advertising this show to me. It was the same scene. I was like, oh, it's a cool scene, but. My wife wasn't interested, so she went out of town for a few weeks, and I was like, this is my time. I'm going to watch Suits. <laughs> the show's like eight years old, at least, 10 years old, something like that. I didn't even know about it until a month ago. Um, and it's like one of the top-selling or top-watched shows on Netflix right now. And it just goes to show you, it's never too late to launch something, right? It, you don't need to worry about I hear so many authors. I go to conferences, and I'll teach some of this stuff. And I hear so many authors, there's fear that they're going to do something wrong. They're shooting themselves in the foot, whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're missing out on some opportunity. I have to do it on day one or week one. And if I don't, my book will never sell. And that's, that's just <laughs> not true. Uh, I know you know that. Um, right. It's but, not do um, or die. And if you miss one thing, yeah. No, I, we're writing books. There's very little that we can't recover from. Uh, and, and launching is, is similar to that too. I, I'm currently going back and working through a series that I haven't touched in four or five years. But I want to fix it up a little bit. I had a worse editing process back then. Um, <laughs> and I want to relaunch it. And I'm going to be able to do that just fine. Now, there may be a few people that have already read it that say, hey, you know what, I'm not interested. I already bought it. But the point is, I'm probably going to be able to launch that book again and make a great amount of sales on something that on a property that exists. It's been around for five years. Um, and so I, I just I, I, I want to encourage everyone with that. Like if you're wondering, well, how do I do this? I need to make sure I've got all my ducks in a row. Don't worry about it. Figure out how you want to launch it. Set some goals for yourself. Line up some newsletter swaps, but don't kill yourself trying to make things happen on some, some magical secret timeline because I don't think there is one. Yeah, I think there might be some of the extremists that's going to hear 
you validating some of their thoughts. Some of the extremists of publish and pray, what do you say about the folks that just hit the publish button and walk away without doing anything as far as getting an ARC team going, getting newsletter swaps? What's your thought on that? My thought is that they're, um, they're either new to the game uh, or they're naive or they're ignorant of what this, this business really is. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't have to be a harsh thing. It's fine if you're ignorant, if, as long as you don't stay that way. Um, if you don't know something, go find out. But the, the truth is, and I'm talking to you, author listening to me right now, answer this question. If you think that that's the way to launch a book, you just you squirt it out there and wait. <laughs> um, you are an author, and that's great. But you're not an entrepreneur. You're not a business owner. You know, these are two different activities. You are allowed to do that. But if you want to have a career at this, if you want to actually build something long term, you need to put a little effort, time, probably some money into that marketing, which mm -hmm. typically happens after the book is launched, but sometimes it's before. The point is, um, you got to be looking at this like a business. And that sounds super obvious, but that's what I would answer to someone who says, well, I just, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. and my answer is, do something and test it. And if it works well, do more of it. And if it doesn't work well, do something different or less of it. Um, it's all a game and we're all learning how to play it. And the rules change every day. That's that's the frustrating part. Yeah. What can I do to increase the odds of a reader buying my book? Uh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, you got to think in terms of, of the funnel. And this is going, again, right back into the marketing landscape. That's my background. So that's what I kind of go to. But yeah. The picture of the funnel, right? It's it's got a, a big opening and then a smaller little. I don't even know if you guys can see that, but you know you know what a funnel looks like. Go picture a funnel. Yeah. Um, the top of the funnel is where you're collecting all the people who might potentially become your reader, and the bottom of the funnel is a super fan, is someone who's bought your book and signed up to hear from you. The question is, how do you get people into the top of that funnel, and how do you curate them into the point where they are a super fan? And that's what book marketing is. Now, I mean, I can answer that question by going into gratuitous detail. Um, but the, the, the truth is, the simple answer is, you can do almost anything you want. Um, there's a lot of tested and, and tried methods that work well. Advertising, social media, email marketing. Uh, sorry, my finger's over here. Um, but there's things that we haven't tried as much. Billboard advertising. Um, maybe there's a way to get some offline, you know, truckers listening to your audiobook by looking at a billboard. The point is, um, you can do all sorts of things. And the real answer is you need to test it for yourself because you're different than me. You write in a different genre than me. Even if you're in the same genre, you write in a different style. You have a different voice. You have a different readership. And so generally I can say those are the three big buckets. Figure out how to advertise, figure out social media, which is branding these days and figure out email marketing. And I mean, figure those out. Those should be foundational. I believe every author should do those three things all the time. If you're a master at those three things, then you can start adding on, you know, I'm gonna go do, you know, billboard advertising, or I'm gonna go make a bunch of post posters and stick them up on, you know, the side of Barnes and Noble, whatever it is. Um, the, the point is, those are the three big ones that I would recommend starting with. But also, if you're further along in your career, and you're just kind of losing sight of some things, go back to those three things. Those are foundational for marketing. Those are the three things that make up that funnel for me, right? So the, the, the top part of it, I use advertising to get people into the top of that funnel. Um, Facebook is a giant data algorithm, right? It knows a lot about a lot of people. And that's freaky, but it also is really cool for people who want to use that data to make money um, selling books. And so I can go put up some ads on Facebook and say, hey, I need people that are like this, 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 this. Give them to me. And Facebook goes, here you go. Here's a billion, you know? And then I just need to curate that relationship so that they don't freak out and go away and eventually they buy my book and then fall in love with me as a writer and buy all my stuff and that's i know it sounds oversimplified but that's really all it is that's all it comes down to i, I love you brought up billboards i know this is going to go off on a little you know tangent here it that's what you and i are good for i, I expected nothing less man yeah have you done billboards before and if so what was the results that you got I didn't get all the way to the end goal uh, with that, but I, yeah. I wanted to, so I've got I plans, I should say, um, I'm not actively pursuing them. There's some other things going on, right? Draft to digital and all that, but I wanted a, um, I wanted a, a website, I called it Road Trip Reads, and it was exactly what it sounds like. It was audio books though, and uh, using uh, digital billboard advertising. So there's a company like Blip for, is one of them. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them. They're super cheap. One second at a time, it ends up being really affordable. Yeah. Um, you can get a billboard and it's full size billboard on the side of a highway and you literally can click on you know a map and I want this corridor or this or that or 
whatever. You know, you can spend as much money as you want, obviously. And uh, I wanted to advertise to truckers, so you you know, people on road trips, basically. Yeah. And you would see uh, it wouldn't be a QR code, but it would be a website that you know you I tell people to go park your car while you get gas, and then go to the website. Don't do it when you're driving. Um, right, maybe right. the passenger in the car sees it and goes to the website. And they're immediately met with an audiobook that just starts auto playing, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was even thinking we could get more specific with genre, like you know, road trip romance or something like that. And it would be romance book, and it just starts playing right there on your phone. And so you immediately are hopefully immersed in this audiobook. And then about a chapter or two into it, it gives you, hey, do you want to keep reading or do you want to go to the next one or whatever? And if you want to keep reading, you purchase the audiobook and it goes to your phone. And you start playing. So that was the idea. Uh, it's a little half baked at this point, but I think there's a lot of um, a lot of things like that where we have structures for advertising that authors haven't even started exploring yet. TV commercials is another one, right? But I don't want to get into that. But the point is, I think this stuff is um, is totally possible. But I wouldn't recommend I don't recommend doing anything like that until you get those three core competencies in marketing down email marketing uh, social media advertising you've covered quite a bit in the short time we've been chatting here but let's take a, a step back here you've seen scores of indie authors come and go especially through the headquarters or over draft at digital and at conferences and such like that what would you say are like the three biggest mistakes indie authors are doing when they're launching their books? Specifically for launching their book, the biggest mistakes. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I think the biggest one, uh, you know, I haven't massaged these very, very much. So uh, maybe this isn't the biggest one. But to me, it seems like one of the bigger ones is authors don't go outside of themselves for feedback um, for whatever reason. Maybe there's, you know, a fear that they're going to, have a vulnerability exposed. Um, but it turns out we authors are very creative in certain areas <laughs> um, and not very creative in others. And so if, if we've got the, the bandwidth to produce an entire book, that's great. But maybe you're not the cover designer for that book, right, author? Um, and so it, a lot of times authors will pop out a book that they're so excited about that it otherwise is very good, but no one will ever open it and see what's inside because the cover sucks, the description's off base, the blurb, you know, it's in the wrong category, that kind of thing. So it really seems to be a big mistake that authors only trust their own um, input, right? What I'm getting at is, guys, you need a network. You need a network of people who you trust, who are in the game, who can say, honestly, listen, Dale, uh, your book is great, man. Cover's not working for me. What if you tried this? It doesn't have to be insulting. You need to find a network of people who can do that for you. It doesn't have to be huge, but three, four, five people that you can give that to and say, hey, you write in this genre or you've seen this genre. What what, what do you think of this book package, right? And they can give you that that advice. Another big one is um, part of the book itself, not editing well. Um, I, I don't <laughs> believe that we all need to be paying, you know, dev, dev editors and copy editors and line editors. Those are great people and they're fun to work with. If you can afford them, do it. There are ways to to not need to do that but you need to do something. You need to have some kind of editing process in place uh, where you're, you're just making it as, if people are gonna give you a one-star review, it better be because they just don't like you, not because your book is poorly edited. There's just no excuse anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, what would you recommend? I mean, if somebody can't you know, afford an editor, uh, do they just stay to themselves or do we go back into the concept of building out a network like what you were just saying? that that's that's my answer yeah i i do think self-editing uh that's an art and a skill set in and of itself yeah. and a lot of authors don't take the time to practice that uh because it kind of sucks i don't really like doing self-editing but it yeah. is very crucial before anybody else needs to see the book or it sees the book i need to go through and, and self-edit and over the years i've i've come to understand really what that means and, and and how hard that can be it's not just reading it and going yeah it's good you know, it's really diving in and maybe reading a chapter backwards, you know, to make sure you can catch it, whatever it is. There's a whole process for all this stuff. Go look up some, there's books on self-editing for writers, I think is what it's called. Anyway, there's more than one book on this and I would recommend going and reading those so that you know you've done all you can do before you pass it off to people. The second step in this editing process for me um, is once we've, we've run the book through, like if it's a publishing company thing, we've run it through our process, self-edited, all that stuff, the author's seen it, we've seen it, then we give it to our street team, our beta team, uh, arc team, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I know those aren't the same thing, but we call them all the same thing. And uh, and, and I, we have a team of like 200 people, and they get the book 
for free in exchange for doing the work of kind of crowdsourcing the editing. Um, now, they don't know they're part of a 200-person team, but they're just reading the book and giving us their feedback. Um, and that can look different. I mean, it depends on who it is. It can look different ways, right? It can be more of a dev edit sort of thing. Uh, we've got some people who are really granular and they want to slide my commas around all the time, you know. <laughs> but the, you usually get pretty good feedback. You have to still go through it and filter it and put it through your sieve, you know, to make sure it's you agree with it. But that takes care of that, like, last 3 to 4% of the typos for us. And as long as the book has been outlined well or planned well, if you're not an outliner, um, you don't really need that dev edit a lot of times once you're relatively experienced at this, my opinion. But that's what that looks like for me. Uh, so I've given you two big mistakes that authors make. Hold uh, on to that third one just a second that, because you just yeah. mentioned something that's that's incredible. You have a 200-person team. How do I get to that point? Because I would love to have 200 readers going through, tearing my stuff apart before it goes to launch. And then of course, being part of that launch and making it successful. I probably, so every book that I launched, it's my name on it. And I run it through my entire street team of 200 something people. Yeah. Uh, it's low, it's low to, it's probably 200, 210, something like that. So it's right around 200. Yeah. Um, I will, I can expect about 50 reviews, 60 reviews on a good one. About a quarter. Okay, so, so you can figure that out. Like, you're getting 30% or less of the people who you give the book to are going to give a review that I don't know why it's frustrating as hell because I'm like, Hey, I gave you guys, you promised, you know, whatever. but that's just the way it is. And so the nature of the, the beast for us is we want as many people as possible doing that because we aren't paying an editor. We aren't paying somebody, you know, $3,000 to go through with a fine tooth comb and do that. Yeah. The way yeah. I did that uh, was from day one, meaning before I even had a career at this, I was just trying to see if I could finish a book. Um, reading, I mean, writing a book, not read. I can, I can read book. I can read a whole book. I'm <laughs> right. pretty good writing a book. I wanted to see if I could do it. And, uh, I knew though that if I liked the book that I was writing, I know I'm not that unique of a snowflake. Like there's probably somebody out there that also would like the kind of thing that I created. And maybe I'd like to find them and kind of capture them in the form of an email address. And so from day one, I had that in my mind is I need to be building an email list. So I launched my first book and I already had, I think, a thousand people on my email list. I was blogging at the time, so I was collecting them that way, right? So I was writing okay. about writing and the process of it and all that. And these people had subscribed. And so when my first book came out, I sent it to them and they bought it. And then over the years, I started asking them if they wanted to be part of this thing I'm calling a street team where they helped me promote it. And that became more of kind of an arc team where they're editing and helping out. And here we are, you know, I've got a list of 110,000 people and 200 of them at any given time are on the street team. Um, but it, it just takes time, money, energy. That's all I did. I, I built a list. I used ads, social media, and more email marketing. Uh, and here we are. Oh my gosh, 110,000 subscribers. Get, you could tell that you you created your own freaking author email marketing platform. My well, that was Lord. why I did it, man. I was facing you know 350 bucks a month at MailChimp or some crap. And I was like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So we started author email, Kevin Tomlinson and I, and eventually was acquired by draft to digital which is why I'm there now. Um, but I still run it. I still maintain it. It works really well. We call it like an open beta, you know, where we know that there's some, some UX UI things that need to be improved, but mm -hmm. everything works fine. And we're sent, we've sent something around like, you know, 16, 17 e million emails through it, um, over the past six years. So the reputation, the deliverability is all top notch. Uh, and it's 1099, $10.99 a month. You can send up to 10,000. I think you can have up to 10,000 subscribers. You can send unlimited. Yeah. You can send the same 100 people a thousand times if you want, but um, we just cap the number of subscribers you have. So it's the most affordable by far. Um, and I, I highly recommend every author go sign up. I was actually watching my emails. I had somebody sign up as we, uh, as we were talking. Hey, there we go. Nice. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, okay. So there was a third point you were getting ready to no, go. There wasn't. I was going to say, I, I gave you two and I can't think of a third one, but if you keep talking, I'll, uh, I'll probably come up with one. Yeah, exactly. You and I riff enough. <laughs> we'll probably be able to come up with something probably really, really good. Think of something. Yeah. There's lots of mistakes we make. So yeah. You know, between, you know, you've got the cover, you've got the advanced marketing and building up that team. What are your thoughts about the actual book description, the blurb that you're putting out there? And also the price point, is that going to make or break the success of a book? I don't think it's gonna make or break the success, man. I, I do think there's a way to market your way through anything you do poorly. 
if that makes sense. <laughs> gotcha. As long as you've got a good product, you can, you know, and I don't mean poorly like um, you've got a bad book or something like that, but if your book is good and you want to price it at $9.99, there is a way to market to sell books at $9.99. Now, it is going to be harder than if you market that book at, you know, price it at $1.99 or $2.99, of course, because price is a big lever that, that customers pull, right? Um, however, it's not going to make or break anything. That's my point. Um, I have, from day one, I launched at $6.99 um, for my, my full length thrillers, which is, especially back then, it was on the higher end, right? A lot of these self pub books were $0.99 cents or $1.99. My goal was to position, and this is kind of branding, marketing, positioning, but I wanted to position myself as an author as one of the, the, the big name traditional authors, right? So the James Rollins, the Andy McDermott's, the Matthew Riley, Dan Brown. Um, these guys are traditionally published and traditional publishers don't understand how ebooks work and um, they're in the business of printing on dead trees. And so they price their ebooks at like $14.99 and then their paperback mass market is like $12.99, right? And so I thought... I'm going to I'm going to look like an on sale traditionally published thriller author. I want people to think, "Oh, this guy his his ebook is only 6.99. I can go get a James Rollins one for 14.99, but I've never heard of this guy. Maybe I'll try him out for 6.99." Um, but if I put it too cheap, you know, if I put it too low, people go, "Oh, this is one of them self-published books." And that was taboo back then, right? Yeah. So that was my goal. That was that was the sole reason I did it. It was pretty arbitrary at the time. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I tried it, and it worked. But I had to market my way through it. I could have sold a lot more books if I had put it at 99 cents because everything just was a little easier. Advertising was cheaper, right? But I did 699 because I believed that's how I wanted to position myself as an author. So I just did it. I, that's not a very <laughs> defined response. I apologize, but that's kind of part of the decision making. Pro like, I, I, you, you have to have a good book, and if you think your book is good, it can be better. So the next one you write, make it better. Challenge yourself to make it better, but all the other stuff is just levers we pull and it's things that change and, and as market trends ebb and flow, like nothing that you do will make or break your book unless your book is not good enough to make it, okay? Uh, but, but again, as you know, that alone isn't enough to make it. Like if your book is fantastic, you still have to market the thing because no one's gonna know it's there. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's just a combination of all these variables and factors, but. Very good. Um, something that I would love to kind of share is something you're probably not going to say anyways, and he's not paying me to say this, but you've got a whole website that you're really building out with some great course materials for people called Book Career in a Year. Share with yeah. me a little bit more about that. Uh, I've already taken the, the dictation course, which is, by the way, one of the best that I've ever taken, although I've never taken any other dictation courses. Um, well, now you don't need to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You also have a course on outlining, and I think you've got another one coming out. So fill fill me in on bookcareerinayear.com. No, I appreciate it. I wasn't going to say anything because you know this is just um, it's like a, a just a way that I wanted to collect all of the nonfiction stuff over the years that I've worked on. Um, like you said, courses, but you know in the past I, I wrote nonfiction books. I'm still working on. If any of the drafted digital folks are watching, I owe them a book on email marketing that I I totally have finished five times and I just rewrote <laughs> the point is um, that's that that's an example of the kind of stuff that I work on that's not fiction I've always loved doing that I've always like that's how author email came to be I thought well there's got to be a better way let me figure out how to do it um, and I I break things a lot and fix them and then they end up becoming something that's that's valuable to authors so anything that's not um, you know draft to digital or you know the things we've mentioned like author email and then um, the other one is self pub book covers which is that that's my role at auth at a draft to digital. Um, if it's nonfiction and I'm I'm doing on something something on the side working on a book or building out a course, um, I have just been putting them all on the website bookcareerinayear.com and the goal is to get information to authors to get people into the you know funnel if you will. And to say, look, you, you guys can do this. You can build a career selling fiction. Um, here's how you do it. Uh, or here's how I did it, I should say. And, um, you know, at some point, I may point people to draft to digital and say, look, you, you want to do this? Okay, well, we do that over here. Go sign up for draft to digital and go check out what we're doing in the author success department, which is, um, you know, author email and self pub book covers. Uh, or if you need distribution, go to draft to digital and get distributed. But if it's something like, um, you know, how to edit your book, draft to digital currently doesn't have anything on how to do that. And so I've been, well, not for editing, but I could put something together and say, hey, this is something I've been working on in my own time. And 
Maybe you guys will like it. If you need help editing, um, here's, and it's all going to live at book career in a year. So that's where that came to be. Um, really though, it's your fault. Like most things in my life, <laughs> you dared do? me to do a course. You did. You told me to do a dictation <laughs> course because you needed to figure out how to do the dictation thing. And I said, yeah, sure. I got nothing better to do. Let me, let me jump, jump in that uh, deep end and, and see how, see how things go. Well, in so my that, defense, that I, I, I've done voice dictation prior but I didn't find I was as efficient as I would like to. And as soon as you had done a video on YouTube, I was like, dude, I need a more like granular approach. And two days later, you're like, hey, here's a full course. Well, hey, uh, we are celebrating the 200th episode podcast here on the Self-Publishing with Dale podcast. You were the very first and only person I reached out to for this because I really wanted wow. to celebrate 200 episodes and what better way than to have my buddy Nick Thacker come on, on here. If you don't mind, you've got a few more minutes. Uh, could we answer some questions here with the live viewers? I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. So let's go on over here. There are a lot of people that are in attendance here, so no pressure. Uh, okay, so author Tom McAuliffe has asks, how important are pre-sales? Uh, like pre-orders? Yeah. That, yeah. Um, I, I don't think they're that important, honestly. Um, they are a tool in the tool shed. And if you really like the idea of having a deadline um, where Amazon will slap you on the wrist and take it away for a year, uh, <laughs> it, and that's like a motivating factor, pre-orders are great for that. Uh, if you just like the idea of kind of figuring out how many sales you're going to get on day one pre pre-orders are great for that but um again this isn't a lever that i pull to you know well i want this book to succeed so i'm going to do a pre-order uh, it just doesn't have anything to do with the marketing right yeah. um putting a book on pre-order i don't think is going to gain any more sales yeah uh, than it would if you just launched it on day one maybe I, actually that, sorry let me let me back up that may not be true there because it's sort of available for purchase before the, the go live date, there is the possibility you get some more sales. And mm -hmm. if you are like a James Rosone, a friend of mine who does only pre-orders, over the years that he's been doing this, his readership knows that the next book is on pre-order all the time. And so they start you know piling on and getting pre-orders early on. I'm That's not my career. And so it doesn't work for me that way. Yeah. Um, something to test though. I, I like the fact that we have that tool available to us because early on we didn't, we couldn't do that at Amazon. Okay, I've got another question here from John Stevenson says, how in the world does Amazon's algorithm work? I gave away nine books in one day a month ago. It was number eight or something. Then the next day it shot back up very fast. What you got to say there, Nick? Look, so don't think of this algorithm as a line or two of code that, you know, is, is this like, you know, this evil being sitting back there going, okay, this is the book that's going to succeed today. Like, it's, yeah. it's this massively complicated organism in code that is trying to do one thing and one thing only, and that is put the right product in front of the right customer at the right time. Um, and so there, it's, and it's not in a silo, right? That means it's not just, you know, you go to the book section, now you're the book algorithm. You go to the, you know, gardening section in Amazon, now you're in the it's all related it's all interrelated and so there's just too many variables to even nail down why it does something it does but it does and it does work and it does put the product in front of the people who are most likely to buy it most of the time um, your job as an author isn't to worry about how many you got one day or the next day your job is to produce the best quality product you can you write the best book you can and then pull those marketing levers as best you can and then let the algorithm say, okay, well, you know what? We had two people that downloaded this book today and they have these buying preferences. So we're gonna show them this book tomorrow. And if that's your book, you know, you're gonna get the sale. If it's my book or it, don't worry about how it does it because mm -hmm. you can't, because it's too complicated. Yeah, it is. There's so many nuances to it. All right, we've got an insider here from Draft the Digital. So naturally, someone's uh -oh. going to ask a question uh -oh. about Draft yeah. the Digital. Tom McAuliffe coming back for some more. He said, "Will D2D ever open its own online bookstore like Book Baby, etc.?" Um, before you even say anything, I'm going to say this: that um, last year, Draft the Digital did acquire Smashwords, and now the Smashwords storefront is directly integrated with Draft the Digital. So um, let me send it back over to Nick because maybe he has some insider information or he can expand on what I just said. I think you nailed it. No, nothing to expand on. We want the Smashwords store to be the storefront that our authors use. So that's the goal. That's the plan. And we're pushing hard to, to get that done. Good stuff. All right. I'm going to keep looking here through some questions and answers. Uh, questions. You'll give me some answers here. Uh, all right. So 
Can you talk about genres that can be successful in indie space? I recently gained a feeling that unless it's romance, you're better off going traditional. Thanks. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, Katarina. Ooh, good Lord. Sorry about that, Katarina. Yeah, no, I wouldn't necessarily agree that it's better to go traditional. Uh, in this, what I mean by that is um, probably what you mean. I'm, I'm just putting words in your mouth, Katarina. But uh, to go with, with a traditional publisher who's going to take the, the majority of your royalties, um, I, I don't recommend that generally. Now, there, there's always a number, right? I just signed a traditional deal for my audiobooks because Congrats. the number was right. Um, thank you. And uh, But it just that just depends on your career and where you are and what you want. But So no, I wouldn't say that it's better to go traditional. Um, I would say that, yes, if you're writing romance, there are a lot of readers who read romance. Uh, so it tends to look like a genre that's easier to succeed in. But there's a caveat, and that is the really bad books don't sell really well. <laughs> and there's a lot more of them because, you know, there's a lot of readers there. So you, you got to love the genre. You got to know the genre. Tropes are extremely important in romance. They're important in all genres, but especially in romance. You cannot write a book that's happily ever after and don't give them a happily ever after, right, or happily for now. You got to know these things. And, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not ready for romance. Um, however, there are a lot of readers there. There's a lot of whale readers, which is the way we define the person um, who reads like gratuitous amounts of books, multiple books a day usually. Uh, they just consume this stuff and eat it up like candy. My genre, thriller, um, more adult you know, fiction, um, action adventure, whatever you want to call it, pulp kind of stuff, doesn't have as many of those whale readers, right? It's just the nature of the beast. So the guys that read my stuff uh, usually are women, uh, mid 50s, 60s is my demographic, uh, my my biggest demographic, they'll read a lot more, but they're still maybe reading once a week or once a month is very common. And so we just don't have that in that genre as much. Now, there, again, there are exceptions, but um, I've experienced that myself. So it is sometimes frustrating when you look at something like romance and you go, well, if I just wrote romance, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> not true. I don't think it's that easy. Um, I, I don't think that you need to run into the arms of a traditional publisher. Um, I do think you just need to study the genres. Um, I would start with what you like to write or what you like to read is probably even even before that. Don't go pick a genre because it sells well or it looks like it's going to be easy to crack. Um, there's a lot of danger down that road. Trust me. Um, if Just because you think it's going to sell well, so I'm going to go do you don't do it. Just focus on the stuff that you're really, really good at and that you love. Because I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I've done it as well, you know, and I'm actually like sci-fi, but I'm not a sci-fi. I don't read enough of it. So I'm like, well, I, when I tried my hand at sci-fi, I was like, well, I didn't, I thought that was going to be it, you know, but so it just focus on what you like to read, focus on what you like to write, get really, really good at it, know your tropes and you can succeed in any genre. And I always love here and you answer some of these things and you have your weekly lives that you typically do over inside your group where you do yeah, cover a lot yeah. of these type of questions. I highly recommend where can people find that Facebook group again? Um, that is, if you just go to, well, I, I think fb.com forward slash groups forward slash book career. Or okay. if you just search book career, uh, book career in a year is the name of the group and it'll pop right up. I'd love to get you guys in there. It's totally free. Just We're just hanging out. We're just authors hanging out. I'm trying to, you know, collect authors who are interested in building a career out of what they're doing. Um, and there's lots of funny memes. I drop a lot of funny memes. So that, I mean, that might be the reason to join that alone. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we got another question here. By the way, folks, if you do have a question, please put a Q in front of your question. So I'll know it. I'm going to try to get to everybody here. But uh, Lord knows we can't be up till midnight. Or can we? Um, exactly. All right. So this one comes from Tam's Psych Advice. That's the uh, best uh, channel name so far here. Tam says, <laughs> how many times do you edit your books before you publish them? Do you have an editing strategy to get it perfect? Oh, editing to get it perfect. Um, no, I don't think there's a such thing as perfect. I do I do want to point out something though, that it's something was really neat that you show inside your dictation course, which is utilizing chat GPT to yeah. clean up some of your, your, your stuff. Share just that brief process, if you don't mind. Sure, no, I'd, I'd love this because it's uh, it was a, such a game changer for me and my productivity. Um, I have always liked the idea of dictating, but the challenge was the cleanup took so long that it, I might as well have just written the book, you know, with my fingies, because uh, it was just it was it slowed me down. And so I kind of I would try dictating, and I'd get dragon dictate, and I, I would abandon it. I did this for ten years, 
and then finally this beautiful young soul named Dale Roberts was like, Hey, I need a dictation course and I need you to teach me how to do this. And I said, okay, great. I can teach you how to do it, but I, I'm still running into that same issue of the cleanup. And then I thought, you know, this AI stuff is getting really popular right now. And I bet if I give it kind of some boundaries to, to stay in, like don't go right for me, but I bet I can probably prompt it to fix some of this dictated text. And, um, that actually is the prompt, please fix this dictated text. And then sometimes if it does get a little tangential, um, I'll, I'll further, you know, prompt it with, you know, fix anything that sounds like a, a homophone, a homonym, um, put the proper punctuation, things like that. And, but don't, and I'll even say, don't change it. Don't change what I've written. And I did this and it was amazing how clean it was because it's not going to introduce a typo, right? Unless you specifically say, I would like you to come up with some typos. <laughs> um, it's going to make it proper English. It's going to make it grammatically correct. Um, and it's also most of the time not going to change anything. It's not going to swap words, you know, nouns for other nouns. And so I found that this was really, really, really huge for my um, productivity, for my efficiency. Because again, I work all day, drive to digital, then I like to go dictate. I like to go drive. So I'll literally just go drive around my state in the mornings, evenings, whatever, and dictate. And that's my writing time. I may only get an hour a day to do that. And so I wanted to be able to write 10,000 words in that one hour, you know, and I figured there's got to be a there's got to be a system to do that. So that's that's all in the course. But uh, it's um, it's a game changer because yeah. if you figure out the right prompts and play with it a little bit, it's basically just copy paste work at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Um, by the way, got to give a big shout out to Lexi Green. What's going on, Lexi? Great to see you join us. Um, uh, Lexi actually had mentioned to Butcher Respawn, uh, DDD has plans to continue improving Smashwords as a platform for authors and readers, which Smashwords has always been a fantastic platform, but I anticipate nothing but good things coming out in the coming year or so. So this is just amazing. I'm going to come over to the podcast chat here. We've got a question from Susan Montgomery. How do you market your books when you write in multiple genres? Do you quote unquote take turns or market all of them all the time? Ideas. Well, so this is a challenging thing because um, you are now two different businesses in a sense, right? You're, you're now, you can't necessarily build the exact same platform in romance that you can if you're writing sci-fi, you know? If you're writing, you know, historical Western romance and happily never, uh, whatever, um, reg re with Regency romance, that's what it's called? Yeah. Like those might be close enough where you can have kind of one pot of readers to dip in. But if you're really in two different genres, like sci-fi and thriller or space opera and fantasy uh, that's pr probably close Fate, space opera and romance you really want to separate that because the readers ne won't necessarily like reading the other th they, they find you for your romance they that necessarily are going to go and read your sci-fi that's fair right so what happens is um the more you can automate this marketing thing the, the better off you'll be um that's why i, I keep saying it. the three buckets for me are advertising uh, social media and email marketing, no particular order, but those are the foundations of it because each one of those things is powerful right now to gain readers um, and to, to stay relevant, stay in front of them. But it's also, th these three things can be automated a lot, right? Yes, you're gonna have to write an email once a week or two, every once every two weeks or whatever, but you can have this autoresponder sequence going on and on and on, author email, we don't limit that. Like you have as many emails as you want. From day one, they sign up, and then for the next two years, they get an email every week, whatever. You can pre-schedule all that. And so once you've done that, yes, there's a lot of work to build it up, but once you've automated some of this stuff, you are, you're now more free to go do the writing thing. That you, the whole reason you're doing it, right? But the, the best part about having the automated systems in place are then you can start really measuring some of the, the effectiveness of this. So you can say, well, you know, this pin name is really, really fun to write, but man, this email sequence just isn't working. People aren't buying any other books. I've got 50 emails that I've written and they're dropping off. They're unsubscribing after book, email number two. So then you can look at it and say, oh, well, I'm just going to rewrite email number two and see if we can affect change there. But that is so much easier to do once it's already automated. I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I apologize, but I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I hope, that's, uh, I hope that serves you well. I, I think once you get into multiple pin names, it's so much more important to automate as much as you can not the writing process, folks. Don't go use ChatGPT to write your book. Don't automate it that way. But automate <laughs> the, the stuff you can automate. Autom automate the stuff that you don't need, that doesn't need to be your voice all the time. 
Well, Susan said that is a good point. All right, so uh, Sloth Dreams Books and Publishing. What are some of the top free PR ways to get your books in front of media, magazines, and more? You know, this is a tricky one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in this, so I'm just take all this with a grain of salt. I don't know the answer. Um, I, I, I would probably guess that it's not worth the time and effort you would take to do that mm -hmm. um, with few exceptions. I think if you're writing like a localized sort of book, something that's set in a specific place, especially historical, um, you have a lot of opportunities to go and, and make some connections with, you know, shop owners, business owners, tourist centers, and potentially get placement there. Um, and that I would extend that to, um, to maybe something like uh, getting some local media, uh, local small paper, that kind of thing it might be more possible to do that. And to do that, all you do with PR, with any PR, is you email the person in charge of it. And you know you don't have to worry about a press release and all that stuff. You can do that, but you gotta make connections with real people. That's how you get media placement, right? We just did this for self-pub book covers. We've got a guy on the team named Jim who's just incredible at this. And he set up all these interviews, but it only worked because he knew them, because he's had relationships with them for 20 years, right? And so the, the, the unfortunate answer, uh, I can't remember the name, uh, is, you got to start making relationships with people and it's going to take a long time. Don't expect to write a book and then squirt it out to, you know, uh, net newswire or something or whatever, and, and have, you know, the New York times call you the next day, want an yeah. interview. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. And you, you already know that, but hope this helps you kind of be, be more creative about, or to be creative about, you know, how you're um, approaching um, a small, like, Sorry, going back to the localization thing. If there's some component of your book that's set in a specific town or something, that's enough to go in and say, hey, look, you're a local brewery, and I would love to sell this book on consignment at your store. Can we work out a deal? Um, you know, buy them a beer first and then try it. And that's how you build the relationship with people. <laughs> you buy a beer for somebody who runs a brewery. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to buy one of your beers, Mr. Brewer. Here, and, uh, this is for you. <laughs> exactly. So uh, next one comes from, oddly enough, uh, writer Cleve Bourbon. Cleve's a longtime supporter here of the channel. Last name Bourbon. That, that's just so appropriate. We're talking about boozing it up. What do you do to prepare for a launch to get visible so you can reach bestseller status? Well, so th these days, uh, there's a lot of competition, right? A lot of people are squirting books out and uh, trying to get them to be successful. And so you may not want to hear this, but usually you have to drop some money. If you're really trying to hit a list, if you're really trying to go um, make some sales, you need to have a lot of sales in a short amount of time. That's the key, right? You can. I have a lot of sales for my books, but they're over the course of 10 years. Um, and so I'm never gonna be you know, considered that, well, not never, but I'm not gonna be seen as that best-selling author because every time I launch a book, nobody knows about it, but yeah. they make money for the next 10 years for me, right? Um, but if you are trying to hit a list and it's important to get the, the, num get the letters, you know, USA Today or Amazon bestseller, whatever it is, um, you're gonna have to drop some cash on ads. You're gonna wanna drop the price to as affordable as possible, can't be zero, but as affordable as possible for your readers, which usually is 99 cents. Um, but then you're losing, you know, if you're on Amazon, you're losing that, uh, a lot of your royalties. I guess if you're doing a, a wide launch, it doesn't really matter at that point. Uh, but the point is, you're probably going to get some sales, but you may not make as much money. So you're, mm -hmm. you're foregoing some profit, potentially, right? Even though you're making 10,000 sales, at 99 cents, it sounds like $10,000, but then when you get the, you get everything back, you may have made, you know, $4,000 or $3,000 yeah. because just, I don't know. Anyway, um, you've spent money on ads and all that stuff, but um, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but yeah, I, if you can't tell, I'm not a huge fan of trying to target the list. I would rather target the readers, get, get the people on your list, get the people sign up uh, to sign up to hear from you and, uh, and build that long-term relationship because it's going to pay a lot more dividends than hitting a list one time. I always love the realistic approach that you have to things because I've always been the person that believes it's bank over rank. I've always looked at, you know, love that it, bank over rank. I would rather make the money than the rank because here's the funny thing is years ago when I made that bestseller status, in numerous categories, I was excited. I shared it with my wife and she was just like, great. Does that get us extra money? <laughs> yeah, right. so, so big dinner tonight or no, we're still eating corn dogs. Okay. Yeah. And it was so it, it, she, she, she was very realistic and she was very practical in that 
tag. Yeah. yeah, sure, I could probably put in my email signature best-selling author or whatever, but is that really going to shift more units? Probably not, but anyway, I've got a good one, and I know you're the perfect person to answer this one because you are all about the mindset. Um, so uh, SD yeah, Houston, okay. longtime supporter of the channel. Actually, I just introduced you to Shannon this past week. Uh, what mindset should a new author have to pursue a best-selling book when they first start publishing? Okay, um, th this is a good one. I'm, I love this question. Um, I want to make sure that every author hears me say this. This is hard. This is challenging. This is something that takes a long time. Yes, there are exceptions. And yes, we all can find the example, you know, of somebody who wrote one book and they went meteoric success and then had a movie called The Martian made out of it, right? Um, which, by the way, wasn't, you know, his first book and he had practice, right? So the point is, what looks like this runaway bestseller, I'm going to go get lucky and, and have a movie made out of my book. Um, oftentimes, the, the, the real truth is that it's, it's actually 10 years in the making. That overnight success took 10 years, right? Um, or, you know, even if, even if it is true that they just wrote one book and it just shot up the ranks and everybody loved it immediately, there's a million people who wrote a book that's even better than that, that never went anywhere. Um, so I, I hate that that, I mean, that's just, it sounds so harsh, but that's so true. Like the mindset should be, this isn't going to work the first time. So if you want to be a writer, keep doing it. That should be your mindset. It, it's not, how do I make this a best bestseller because I've only got one shot at it. If that's you, write the book, be happy that you finished it. That's an accomplishment, right? Writing a whole book is, is not nothing, but sorry, that that's it. You know, it's it's probably not gonna be the bestseller that you want it to be. Um, but if you, if you can shift your mindset to, you know what, I'm gonna try this and I'm just gonna keep doing it because I love doing it, because the process is fun, because the journey is fun, because I like the bringing something to life in this way. Um, that's the mindset of success for an author. That's it. Um, Hope that doesn't sound too harsh, but that's that's how I would answer that. I love it. I love it. Next question comes from Robin Oaks. Can you give us any ideas how to use social media to get into the big part of the funnel? Yeah. So this is the one I'm uh, I'm doing a lot of work on my uh, social media platforms. Uh, that's you know the the book career to your group is part of it. I've also got an author page. I've also got a uh, an author group for my fans and, and readers, people who want to kind of connect and with each other. Uh, and I also have a page for my non, so, so let me recap. This is just on Facebook. I have a personal profile. That's where pictures of my kids go. I have a, um, an, an, uh, an author page as a fiction author, a page people can like. Um, I have an author, fiction author group people can be a part of and communicate with each other. I also on the book career in a year side, the nonfiction stuff, anything that do draft to digital, all that ends up in the, the Facebook group and the Facebook page for that. That's five. I don't know, five things, right? That's just Facebook. Um, so the strategy for me is I want to post four times a day in each of those things. Now, there's some overlap. There are some um, posts that I might write that, that can go on all of those accounts. Uh, usually it's one or the other. It's like the fiction side or nonfiction side. That's an easy separator. Um, if it's a meme, it sometimes can go, if it's about you know writing and marketing, it goes in the nonfiction side. But the point is I want to do that four times a day. And Facebook is my foundation. It's my main outpost. Um, meaning that's the one I'm going to focus on because that's where the readers are. That's where my networks are. Um, but they also will be reposted automatically to Instagram, TikTok, if it's a video, YouTube, if it's a video uh, reel, if it's a short, uh, Twitter. So I don't go to those places to, to interact because it's not, I'm not focused on those, but I'm trying to be everywhere with the stuff that I do. If this is sounding like a lot of work, guess what? It's a lot of work. It can be automated. But I don't want to automate anything I, I haven't really understood and mastered, right? So I don't want to do that until I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, I can create content and Sunday's my content day and I'm going to create all this stuff and batch it and then the whole, you know, I, I want to do that later. But I want to find out the amount of times I need to post every day and what I need to post and just get better at that uh, and really start seeing results, you know, follows, likes, whatever, before I, I try to double down and automate all that stuff. It's a lot of work, but guys... The last, and this changes every day too, every 10 minutes there's a new number, but the last number I heard was 6% of your followers will see something you post on if it's Facebook. I believe um, it. There's a similar number for all the other platforms, but that means that if I post 10 times to a, a group with 100 people in it, um, six people will see it each one of those 10 times. 
and and usually because of this complex algorithm right that runs the world now um it's probably going to be maybe different people sometimes it's the same people but the point is you have no control over who sees it but here's the upside you should have no fear of posting too much because of that you should have no fear of emailing too much because people are people and they're sometimes traveling or sometimes working and they'll just archive the email so the point is don't think that you're doing too much communication there's no way you're doing too much communication now, if you're a spammer, an internet marketer, shut up, stop communicating. You guys are authors. You're beautiful, amazing authors, and you need to be communicating more because you're competing with those spammers, with Bed Bath and Beyond that's been going out of business for 30 years and still sends me emails. Like you're, you're, you need to be communicating more because your readers want to hear from you, and the world needs more books. It needs your book. That's my social media strategy. Nice. All right. So I've got a question, a couple more questions here, and we'll go like three more questions. If anybody has questions, please pop, post them inside here because otherwise, Nick, he's just going to go to sleep. That's it. I'm going to go right to sleep. Right to yep, sleep. No dinner or anything. Dreamingtruth.author Felicia asks, will publishing inconsistently mess up my sales? Um, well, no. I mean, we got to define some of these things. What, what does mess up mean, for example? But mm -hmm. no, it's not going to, you're not going to, I'll say this again um, in case you missed it. There's just nothing that we do as authors that we cannot recover from. Okay, so is there a perfect way to launch and market and promote all your books? Yes, probably. Does anybody know what it is? Absolutely not. We're all just trying to figure this out as we go and we're making changes and iterating. I will say it's more likely to get you, know, you more successful faster if you're consistent. Um, but if you're consistent, it looks like one book a year, that may not be enough if you're writing romance because your readership is just gonna go away. They, they're not going to wait a year. They're, they're, they got 51 weeks. You know, they want to read one book a week, right? So the point is um, consistency is very important, but typically you want to be consistent at a faster speed than, you know, one book every year or probably one book every nine months. You probably want to be doing six months if you can at the very at the bare minimum. Uh, this is all very, very genre dependent. So don't quote me on any of this, but that's kind of where we are as an indie space right now. Like you don't need to be writing a book a month. You certainly don't need to be releasing a book every two months, but you know, three to six months seems to be a really common, uh, common ground for authors. So if you're able to write faster, um, don't, you know, write a bunch of books and then release them all on the same day and then wait two years. Try to be consistent about those releases because it's just gonna everything's gonna get easier when you do it that way. Nice. All right, this one actually is more a D to D question, and since you're here, we might as well go ahead and answer it. Tex asks, uh, "I'll ask again. What is the advantage of going wide on draft to digital versus KDP Select?" Well, so you can't go wide uh, on KDP Select. What the what the 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 two terms are are wide or exclusive, mm -hmm. right? And exclusive means in the indie space, what we're saying when we say going exclusive means to Amazon only. Click in that box that says for 90 days, I'm enrolling my book in KDP Select which means that ebook cannot be sold anywhere else but Amazon. You can't give it away, you can't put it on your mailing list, it has to be just Amazon. There are some bonuses that you get, some benefits, I should say. Um, you, you're gonna be enrolled in some promotional opportunities um, that may pay dividends, but mainly you're gonna get paid for every page that somebody reads when your book is enrolled in KDP Select, right? So you click an Amazon, a, a Kindle, and you read a page, some author's getting paid that money for it. Uh, when you're not in KDP Select, when you just use Amazon as a platform to sell and don't check the box, um, you don't get that benefit. But you also are now allowed to go wide, which means to go sell anywhere else you want. Um, draft to digital is a distributor. So what we do is we'll take your book and we're going to squirt out a version that is going to look great on any device. And then we're also going to distribute it to all of the stores around the world that ebooks can be sold in. Um, and you can opt out of certain ones. You can go to libraries or not. Like there's all sorts of options that we've got when you go wide through draft to digital. And I'll just tell you right now, it doesn't matter how much money you're making. It's worth the 15% that we'll, we'll, we'll use as uh, our, our payment um, because you don't have to sign up with 200 different stores and do tax interviews with all of them and then log in and check your sales and, oh, they didn't pay me for that month and I get an email. We'll do all that. Just let us do it. It's so much easier, right? It's so it's worth the money. Um, I call it found money because there's so many stores that I never... I had never even heard of them until I sign up draft to digital for some of my books to go wide. And now I'm getting sales from these places and I'm happy to give draft to digital 15% for those sales that never would have come in in the first place. Does that make sense? Oh so that's yeah. The, uh, that's the breakdown for me. It's, it's like found money. Uh, you go, you go wide and it just saves you the, the hassle to do it through draft to digital. 
You know, to, to me, Nick, I, I think what it comes down to is how well is the KDP Select program treating you? If you yes. feel like you're getting paid your worth, then yeah, stick with it. But to me, I like to have distribution into libraries. So that's why I use avenues like Draft to Digital because I've got Overdrive, I've got Hoopla, I even have other checkout systems like Scribd. Those three avenues I wouldn't otherwise be able to get if I just remained over on KDP Select. I just had to chime in because I'm just Absolutely. super passionate about going wide. Well, and it's worth noting, we're talking about eBooks only here, right? Draft right. to Digital though, we now have KDP Print, uh, sorry, we have a D2D Print. <laughs> KDP Print is the Amazon version of that. Uh, Ingram, so you can, and you, you aren't ever exclusive with your paperbacks, or if there's a contract that asks you to be, don't run away from it. But generally speaking, all the paperbacks that you sell, those are non-exclusive by nature. So you can sell those anywhere you want. You can go to libraries with your paperback books. Yep. Same thing with audio, same thing with hardcover. Um, so we're just talking, when people say wide or exclusive, usually they're meaning, you know, ebook. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like I have a lot of series that are doing really well in KDP Select, so I leave them there. But I've got some that aren't doing anything. So why not go wide with them and promote those and try to get that built up? Because then I have access to so many more people around the world. Um, so it really does, like you said, it becomes a business decision. All right. Uh, we've got another question here. It looks like some are popping up here. Uh, are you good for time right now, buddy? I'm good for time, man. I'm just sitting here hanging out with Dale. No, Nowhere else I'd rather be. Uh, Butcher Respawn, Carter Harlan asks, how important is cover design? I love this one. Uh, it is very important. And I'm not saying that because I now run a company that sells self-pub book covers to authors. Um, that's part of it. Look, I've always been a huge uh, geek when it comes to graphic design. Like I said, I have a marketing background. I love good design. I just love. I just. I think I'm. I think I'm good at it. But the point is, um, these days, there's a lot of books out there, and they all have covers. Okay, and so it's much more competitive now than it used to be. Um, if your book cover isn't not only good but on point as far as brand and and genre and expectations go, you're going to lose the sale. Because it's usually the first or second thing that that any reader is going to see, you know. They may hear the title, but chances are they're going to Amazon and they're going to see a cover, and that's what's going to let them click through. Now, here's the deal: don't design a cover, or have a cover designed, to be clickable. You don't want it to to attract a click because that kind of implies that the cover looks really cool or looks really different, and people are intrigued by it, but they don't want to read it. They're just they like the cover. You need a cover that looks like pretty much all the other covers in your genre. So go pop open Amazon or pop open Apple, iBooks, whatever it is, and go look at all the covers in the genre that you're going to write in, and you'll start to see some some expectations and some uh, trends, right? You'll start to see that okay, the author name is on top, or the you know the the title's on top, and it looks blocky. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, guys. Just make a cover that won't lose the sale. So I like to say it this way: your cover is only going to lose the sale. So that sounds really dangerous, right? Like you want to make sure your cover just gets the person to the next part of the process. You don't want it to be pretty. You don't want it to be like the best and most intriguing thing ever. You just want it to be really, really good on brand, on point. And usually that means you're paying for a professional cover. Either someone's designing a custom or you do a pre-made cover like what we sell now at draft to digital or you um, are working with somebody who's going to give you an illustration um, that you can turn into a book cover. The point is, you want it to look like the stuff that's in your genre that's selling. And that's pretty easy to discover. You just got to do the work. You got to go through and click on covers and see them. And, you know, um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can talk about covers all day long, as you all know. It, it, here, here's a little bit of praise for you. I've been ogling over your website. Fabulous. What advice do you have for driving traffic to website? This is Civil Ward, longtime supporter here of the channel. Thank you. No, I, I have... I'm, currently working on my websites, but I'm going to stop telling people that because I'm always currently working on my website. <laughs> That's just the nature of websites now. As soon as I design something, uh, and I do my own web design because I, I, in marketing, we sold websites. That was my background. Um, I, uh, as soon as I finish finish something, some trend comes out. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to do parallax now, you know, whatever it is uh, on, on the page. So it's always under, under construction. But in order to, to answer your question, to drive traffic to the website, three buckets. Email marketing, social media, advertising. Those work for websites and, and traffic generation just as well as they work for selling a book or getting someone on the mailing list. It's all the same thing, folks. Like what you're doing to market your book on Facebook is probably something you can do to point to your website. Uh, you know, I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but um, I don't do anything different. You know, largely speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm 
doing the same three marketing activities, the three buckets that I mentioned before. Nice. All right. What are your thoughts on fan fiction, Hawkins asks? I I don't write it. Um, I don't have any <laughs> opinion because I don't, I don't really write it or read it. Um, but I, I know that it's very successful when it's very successful. Um, I just, uh, I don't, I, I'm the wrong person to ask because I don't have any experience with it. Um, I always felt like fan fiction was, if I was really, really, really into a series, um, I would maybe do fan fiction for myself, you know, just because it's fun. Um, I, I wouldn't, personally, again, I wouldn't approach it with the perspective of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell, you know, thousands of copies of this piece of fan fiction. Um, but again, I'm the wrong person to ask because I've never experienced it before. Gotcha. All right. Uh, there was another question over here on the main channel. All right. Uh, this one comes from M.M. Ward. M.M. asks, uh, Kindle lets authors have five book for free days. Do you recommend using them together or dropping a free day here and there to coincide with other book publishes or holidays? That's a great question. Um, my, again, I keep saying this. I feel like I have to I'm be my own disclaimer for everything I say because, folks, everything should be tested. Uh, you hear me say something, go test it. Don't just say, oh, Nick said this, so it has to be true. Um, your books are different. Your career is different. But this is what I do. I use them all at the same time. And usually it's, it's not even all five at the same time. It might be three. What I do is I run for a BookBub featured deal for whatever book it is. I choose free most of the time, the price, uh, price point free, because they're enrolled in KDP Select. Uh, usually, when I'm, books that I'm talking about doing this with, they're in KDP Select, which means I get paid for the pages read if they purchase it through Kindle Unlimited. This is after years and years of testing. Um, I don't know the number. I've had, I think I've had probably 30 featured deals through BookBub, and that's probably going to blow some people's minds who can never get a BookBub deal. Um, I have a book that I wrote on how to get BookBub featured deals because good there's book. a process for it. Thank you. Um, and if, if you can't afford it, just laugh. I'll, I'll email it to you guys. But this is information I want people to have because BookBub is such a great company and they love working with authors. They have some things that you can do to have more agency over whether or not you get selected. But the point is, I've had a BookBub every two months for as long as I can remember uh, or one every three months for as long as I can remember. And uh, what that means is I've tested a lot of different iterations of BookBub featured deals. And I have found that the free price point for a book in Kindle Select um, worldwide is, that's kind of my, that's my jam. That's what I want to do. And once I do that, um, I set the book for free on Amazon using one of the f free promo days. And what I'll do is, um, if I'm, if I'm not being lazy, I'll promo stack, which is I'll go get other promotions for free books, you know, uh, free booksy, anything written word media is great. I love those guys. Uh, the fussy librarian, which I think is all part of their promo stack now, but you can go find these other places. They're not as good as BookBub. They don't have as many, they don't drive as many sales as BookBub, but they're great to kind of stack up before the BookBub date. Or you can do the Wayne Stennett approach and, you know, do the BookBub and then after. Like, the, it doesn't matter, but the point is you're telling Amazon that, hey, I don't have a spike in sales. I've got people every day more and more interested in this book and, you know, here's the BookBub sales that last day or the first day, however you stack it. Uh, the algorithm, I know, answering the question somebody asked me earlier, Amazon's algorithm doesn't like spikes. It likes slow and steady. So that's why we do the promo stacking. So you can do a big, huge promo with all five free days. What you want to do is pick the smallest place for that first day um, and then pick the book bub for the last day or just switch it around. Do book bub on, at first and then go down. Does it make sense what I'm talking about? It doesn't really matter which order you do it, but you're just showing Amazon that there's you know, steady amount of sales either leading up to or leading away from BookBub. And I usually do leading up to. Um, but I'm usually lazy, man. So I'll do the BookBub featured deal and uh, forget to set all the other free promos. And then I end up setting the book for free um, the day before the BookBub featured deal just to make sure that everything works out right. And then what I look at is after the BookBub deal has run, you can actually stop the promo anytime you want. Um, and I'll wait until the rank... Um, or sorry, I'll wait until the, uh, the the amount of sales I'm getting on that free book starts to go down. So that usually I, I can see in the, the the rank in the overall free, you know, number one, number two overall free in the Kindle store, that mm -hmm. little thing. Um, if that starts to go down, you know, now it's five, now it's ten. I'll stop the promo um, as long as it's been a day. Like BookBub requires you to have the book live for a day. I'll stop the promo because usually that means 
people are still clicking on the promo and they go over and they see it. Oh, it's not free anymore, but you know what? I really want to read it. It looks good and they'll buy it. Um, so it's just kind of a way I've found to generate a few more sales um, after that promo. But you didn't ask about BookBub. You asked about free promotions. So I sometimes use all five. Sometimes I just use three. Sometimes I just use two. It really just depends on how lazy I'm feeling that particular <laughs> BookBub run. <laughs> And wow. there's other, you know, sometimes I'll do something uh, for my mailing list. I'll say, hey, this book is free, and I'm only telling you guys, and I'll set it free for a day. Um, it really just depends on on what I'm doing. All right, we got one more question here. If anybody else has additional questions, please make sure that you fire them off here. Richard Del Connor says, is Findaway Voices worth the reduced royalty of Audible, not exclusive royalties? Yes. <laughs> um, here's the deal. There, there's always a caveat with everything, right? Like, I like Findaway. I know the guy that started it. I know people that work there. Like, they're just good people. Yeah. Um, they're, I'm not saying that everybody at Audible is a bad person, I'm, but I'm sure there's a few. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Audible doesn't care about you. They don't, they don't, you're just a number, you know, barely. They'll, they just don't, they don't care. They don't care. I don't like Audible. And um, it's an Amazon company to make it even worse. So you're just like doubly a number in their system. And uh, Find A Way is just cool. I like working with them. That's worth the reduced royalty rate for, you know, for going wide. Um, the other truth is things are changing. The winds of change be blowing, folks. Uh, Audible isn't driving as many sales as it used to drive. Nope. This is empirical. It's not, you know, it's anecdotal evidence, I should say, not empirical. Um, but I, for my own career, I've seen, you know, like, okay, well, Audible, Amazon, aud audiobook sales are now just one of the stores where my books are sold. And I'm making as much money on those other ones as I am through Audible. So there may be some benefit, you know, if you just, if you know your readership just loves Amazon and that's all they ever buy from, then, you know, yeah, maybe it's worth being exclusive. Um, but for me, I would much rather take advantage of some of these new opportunities um, in the audiobook game. There's new stores popping up. Um, I was talking to Dale about this. I actually had AI generated voice uh, narration um, that I was testing for some of my books and I released those for free on YouTube as a way to, to build a monetization for my YouTube channel. Um, and it worked like gangbusters. And now I get about a hundred bucks a month just from YouTube, from free audiobooks that I had created uh, as an AI. And because they're non-exclusive, I still have, you know, the ability to go make a, a human narrated version of that and sell it at these different stores. That's just one example. But, but I recommend not being exclusive with any of your audiobooks ever, because the game's different now. There is no 800 million pound gorilla in the room like there used to be. It's still there. It's just a tinier gorilla. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And I don't want to go off on a rant here when it comes to Audible. I've got my opinions about them. <laughs> yeah, for I, sure. like, I know I'm poking the bear here. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You just don't get me started. Don't get me started. So we're not going to yeah. even get me started at this point. But get I, him I started, though. get him yeah. started. If you can. Oh, yeah, yeah. I start raging and such. Yeah, to say the least. Love me some Findaway Voices. They're just a fantastic team. And they're based out of Ohio. How can you not love How them? can you not like someone from Ohio? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Nick, man, you've spent well over an hour here with me today to celebrate this 200th episode. I was going to have this giant celebration and such like that, but I'm like, screw that. I'm going to bring Nick on because I'm going to ask him questions that I want to have the answers to. So thank you so much. How can people get in touch with you, buddy? I am imminently searchable on the internet. So, you know, if you're a platform that you want to find me on, search for me. I'm probably there. Um, you want to shoot me an email, just my name, nick at nickthacker.com. Of course, I'm with Draft to Digital as well, so you can email me there. Like, there's all kinds of ways. Uh, best way is to go find me on Facebook because that's where I live and uh, and breathe most of the time. And if anything sounded interesting to you, you know, with the Facebook groups that I mentioned, uh, either my thriller stuff or the nonfiction stuff, go find out what I'm doing over there and uh, come be part of the fun, cool kid club. Uh, it's not. We're all weirdos. But, you know, go be part of the weirdo club with us um, on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, Dale, I, thanks for having me, man. I think... I, this is exactly what I was hoping um, we would do with one exception. I wish that I got to hear your answers to all these questions as well. Because, dude, you know, you, you can bring it, man. Like, this is this is good stuff. I know that you'd have different answers, but, but like, really, really good wisdom bombs and nuggets you'd be dropping on all of us. So that's the only change I would ever make is, you know, no one wants to hear me talk this much. This was great, though. I appreciate you having me on, man. This is a lot of fun. You know, I need to keep you and Mark Lefebvre around. You guys always stroke my ego, make me feel a little bit better. So, all we, right. If we, you know, we figure we blow smoke, then maybe you'll get invited us back on these podcast episodes every now and then, you know? There you go. All right, <laughs> folks, I'm going to hit the end screen. Thank you so much for tuning in.
in screen. The projects we do at Self Publishing with Dale would be much harder to fund. If you want to contribute to the cause, visit dalelinks.com slash memberships for details and get your on-screen shout out at the end of each broadcast. Till later, this has been Self Publishing with Dale and I'll see you soon.